Insights from the world's best medical minds. You are watching the right doctors.com. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's nice to be here, and uh, we'd like to introduce ourselves before we take this session ahead. Um, I have with me Dr. O.P. Yadav, <clears throat> and it's my privilege to both uh, be associated with him and introduce him. He is the CEO of uh, National Heart Institute in Delhi and has an exemplary background in both armed forces and in a, and, a, and a medical career, in addition to this administrative hat which he holds right now. Um, I am the Dr. Ravindra Mehta. I am a pulmonary critical care uh, physician uh, trained in India and in the US and currently uh, employed with Apollo Hospitals in Bengaluru. Uh, and we are here to talk on uh, the topic of the decade or the century at this point, COVID-19 and of course some specific aspects to it. What we are addressing today is cardiopulmonary uh, manifestations of COVID-19 and that is something we'd like to take up in this brief discussion, uh, taking advantage of existing knowledge and of course the Dr. Yadav's perspective and what I can add in the midst of uh, the huge amount of knowledge and information which has inundated us. So to go back to this, I'll just put a brief, I'll just give a brief summary before we take up the discussion. COVID-19, everyone knows well about what's going on. The treatment, the, the clinical manifestations and treatment has been one of the fastest moving thing that medicine has ever seen. We have never seen uh, the, the urge to come out with explanations and therapies acceptance of that so fast so quick and in such a knee-jerk fashion largely because of the speed of the disease and and the overwhelming uh, need to try and find some explanations and some therapies which is going to pre prevent the deluge of morbidity and mortality which we thought if the disease will get indeed it has been a problem we flip from the fact that it's got it doesn't have such a high mortality on the other hand it's killing people like crazy out there and the covid clock is watched uh, with with concern by everybody uh, in the world at this point and so with this entire background the idea is to, to spend some time to try and understand some physiological aspects which may help us in the thinking process cardiopulmonary interaction manifestations or or processes is what we will briefly discuss today uh, since it's a respiratory disease, a lot of the in initial thing was that it's like any acute lung injury, but more and more has come out in this. It has now moved from the typical quintessential cut and paste regular ARDS to much more than that. <clears throat> and we use this as an opening dialogue to take the session ahead. Dr. Yadav, your take on this fact, it what started off as an upper respiratory going on to lower respiratory infection and which led to this clarion call of ventilators has now taken a shift in some other direction. Would you like to tell us something more about that? Sure, you know, as you put it very, very succinctly and quite brilliantly, this is a disease which is affecting us medically, socially, uh, you know, and virtually any and every organ of the body today has been implicated as far as the manifestation of COVID is concerned. So though the primary mode of entry is obviously the uh, oral cavity and the lung pneumocytes and the vascular endothelial lining there, but there is no organ which is spared. And the ultimate we have in cardiology is the Kawasaki kind of a disease and they're saying there is a multi-system inflammatory response. So the kidneys have been involved in these, and renal failure is one of the important modes of death. We have had strokes, both small blood vessel and large blood vessel involvement, and an absolute plethora of cardiac manifestations and pulmonary, obviously, you are the master, and it has been the, the, the primary focus of this virus are the lungs. So it's virtually devastated us on all fronts medically. But, you know, going by non-medical also, even economically and socially, it's divided us. You know, the divide has been so severe, much more severe than even, you know, the divide of the caste system of the those kind. But here, the COVID and the non-COVID divide, the haves and the have-nots divide, the migrants and the non-migrant divide. So it's devastated us in more than one ways. So, a very good way of putting things into perspective. Now, when we get on to the further physiological aspects, which have been both confounding as well as provocative, we have now realized that this is uh, this is now a very systemic sort of inflammation. So, Dr. Yadav's keyword 
inflammation and he touched on various areas when he mentioned the kidney and he talked of this kawasaki like thing this kawasaki like thing has come now as a delayed thing and it's come in the pediatric population the one population we thought was actually spared of the dire and severe manifestations of covid they're seeing a delayed syndrome which is akin to this uh, like a vasculitis and more and more is being uh, uh, looked into researched and uh, this space has to be uh, carefully observed to see what's going on but it's put a concern element albeit with a lower incidence but on the regular spectrum what we have actually been dealing with a lot is that beyond the pulmonary system the words which have been used is of course primary cardiac involvement and then this entire vascular involvement which is becoming an issue so dr yadav this cardiac involvement of covid 19 would you like to tell us something more about that well that's a very protein manifestations you know the prime thing has been the so called what you call uh, a uh, myocardial injury we have found that there is a raised levels of cardiac troponin or cardiac enzymes but on angiography the coronary arteries are totally normal so it is not an atherosclerotic plaque related what typically we call the type 2 myocardial infarction it is more of a uh, supply uh, demand imbalance type 1 myocardial infarction or myocardial injury then we have you know arrhythmias of all kinds uh, we have bradyarrhythmias, arrhythmias tachyarrhythmias supraventricular and ventricular arrhythmias and the number one in this is atrial fibrillation and some of these arrhythmias are also related to the drug intake you know hydroxychloroquine and uh, azithromycin combination it has been shown uh, in 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 one of the studies that if both drugs were taken together, then there was an extremely high incidence of ventricular arrhythmias and both the mortality was increased. So if you had only HCQS, 8.4% were uh, ended in fatal events, but if you were taking azithromycin, 20% of these ended you know, with death or mortality. And the mortality was two times higher and arrhythmia is 20 times higher if the two were taken together. So we all know that the WHO has withdrawn that study called the solidarity study or withdrawn the enrollment of that study. So arrhythmias are another big problem, whether spontaneous or drug induced. Then we have cardiomyopathies like situation, you know, this could be a stress cardiomyopathy, it could be uh, cytochrome uh, sepsis uh, combination producing a cardiomyopathy and heart failures tend to become worse and thromboembolism seems to become be becoming the sign of uh, quinone of this uh, of this pathology of uh, covid-19 and microvascular as well as macrovascular so it's it's across a wide platform that cardiac manifestations are presenting and Kawasaki we just mentioned and Kawasaki is not just children in fact lately just about three or four days back they've reported Kawasaki like syndrome even in adults so that's kind of worrying the kind of inflammation it produces yeah that's interesting you started using protein I think you described the protein manifestations so you know uh, interesting and excellent science but very concerning clinical ramifications when you understand that it's just not a virus which is doing lung stuff as we saw with other areas like h1n1 and all this one is actually working through that dreaded word called systemic and that is what's creating a problem everywhere as he rightly pointed out you know it's every the the cardiac manifestations are both uh, you know the, the the muscle is involved the arrhythmogenic component the vascular component and uh, not the atherosclerotic component as we talk about. So that's something we have to keep in mind when we both see a patient at the same time, figure out what to do with them. Now on the other fronts, the pulmonary fronts, the pulmonary vascular fronts to add a little to what he already outlined and touched on is that uh, this is the, the, the vascular component is getting to be a big problem because originally we like to compartmentalize things. We like to think that this is an alveolar interstitial pathology pathology this is going to be a vascular pathology separately but when an inflammatory response tends to cause varying amounts of both then the treatment becomes more complicated and this is what we're seeing right now various fancy terms have come to describe the pulmonary vascular components of covid and it's been called pulmonary vascular pulmonary vascular 
endoplegia. It has been called the syndrome of, uh, of, of pulmonary endotheliolitis um, and so on and so forth, which leads to pulmonary vascular thrombosis. So all these terms, vasoplegia, vascular thrombosis in the pulmonary bed, as well as endotheliolitis are indicating an inflammatory thrombotic process. So inflammation, triggering of thrombosis, leading to clot occlusion, which leads to manifestations such as hypoxemia, sudden deterioration, sudden death, requirement for ventilators and so on. It has been extremely challenging to both understand these and predict these. To add to what I'm saying right now, these manifests have led to a high amount of confusion where when you're trying to treat patients, are you going to treat the, the antiviral element which everyone's focusing on with medications or are we trying to treat an, an undiagnosed thrombotic element which is difficult to catch and we have only indirect markers or are we going to treat the damage to the lung which is either secondary to the inflammation or direct because of virus damage it's been very difficult to figure out and then this interacting with the manifestations uh, in the heart which dr yadav mentioned has made it a potpourri which has made covid 19 uh, not the regular cut and paste uh, in algorithmic disease but has led to a high amount of clinical uh, acumen at the bedside to try and figure out in the sick population in the not so sick population fortunately we're quite okay so this sort of disease spectrum, Dr. Yadav, you've been around for a long time. Have you seen viruses commonly doing this and confusing the world community at large that we're changing our recommendation week and, you know, center A of eminence is not doing what center B of eminence is doing and guidelines are also coming like a, a diamond doesn't like wickets in a T20 match? Well, certainly not, obviously. It has been, as you use the word right in the beginning or the phrase, it's been a knee-jerk reaction from a lot of us. And even when we are talking, I'm not convinced what we are talking is hardcore science because it's lots of it is based on, you know, level C data or level C experiences, anecdotal experiences. We are talking of pulmonary endothelialitis. Now that word has arisen from an autopsy series in NAGM of seven patients just seven patients. And they've come out with new terms like intussusceptive angiogenesis and vascular uh, endothelialitis and microangiopathies. So, you know, uh, because of the fear which has been driven in, in fact, there was a very nice study which came and a lady, I think from USA epidemiology department who said the biggest virus has been the Imperial College of London, which gave out the first figure of 2.2 million deaths, which created all this fear in the world and the data flying so much without any evidence base for it. And today that has become the biggest uh, danger lurking that there is more data than we need. Having said that, have we seen that earlier? Yes, MERS came, SARS came, but they were obviously in a localized uh, domain and they were not as widespread as this one. This is pandemic, those were epidemics. So this is an unprecedented one, I agree with that. So interesting. So I think to um, summarize an interesting discussion, we started off time to talk of the cardiopulmonary manifestations or occasions of COVID-19. Uh, Dr. Yadav brought out a very interesting aspect initially about, uh, of course, the fact that this is way above and beyond what we're trying to localize on. The disease has an impact which has been unprecedented in a century. We then went on to discuss cardiac manifestations which are largely non-atherosclerotic and we're, they're related to myocarditis, to arrhythmias, to medication effect, which he very uh, you know, importantly pointed out, which is becoming the hub of discussion the last week or two. Um, and then, of course, the, the thrombotic component, which is part of a generalized inflammation. This word inflammation was reiterated and its manifestations are also there in the pulmonary circulation, where these fancy words, you know, you like catchy words, but they at the same time leave as much in doubt as they clarify. So either we're talking uh, endothelialitis, which is an inflammation. So are we talking inflammatory inflammation followed by thrombosis? Or are we talking a primary thrombosis with sequelae anywhere else? It's difficult to figure out. So the pulmonary vascular component, as we said, has been a mixture of endothelialitis or inflammation, thrombosis with its, uh, with its ramifications, not only in the pulmonary circulation, but rest of the body. And that is why people also, talk, we are we're seeing strokes with COVID-19, we're seeing renal involvement of an inordinate nature and so on. 
So this inflammatory thrombotic phenomena is a systemic phenomena. Of course, with the lung being a major part of what is hitting everybody in the clinical treatment protocols and, and observations worldwide. So bottom line, COVID has now shown itself to be what tuberculosis used to be called, the master mimic. That because of multiple uh, arenas in which it is acting, the inflammation, thrombosis and a systemic spread, it is uh, involving many organs and each uh, each organ system is being looked differently from the point of view of how to understand, how to treat and how to prevent uh, in, in a major way. I think this is science in progress. As we talked about, this is going to keep going on. And this is something which has to be uh, reviewed periodically so as to both understand it better and put in better treatment aspects on the ground. So, so this would be a summary of what we have discussed today. Dr. Yadav, if you have any further closing comments, we will be happy to listen to you. Otherwise, we will close this discussion. Well, I think, Ravi, you have summed it up beautifully. And it's, you know, it's not only just the acute manifestations that we have been always debating, you know, in all the literature that we have gone to today. We seem to be fighting the fire. But at some stage, we will have to think of what are the residual effects of this virus? Because there is some evidence, at least from cardiac manifestation, that some of these uh, changes that we are talking of the, especially the RV dysfunction that seems to be lasting for at least uh, more than a month. You know, in a very recent study from, from China, the Wuhan study, they found that roughly 58% of the patient on, a, on an MRI study in the follow up period had late gallodinium enhancement suggestive of a fibrosis and diffuse myocardial edema was found in 58%. So there is going to be lasting legacy of this besides you know uh, the acute manifestation and that's another arena we will have to at some stage address once we get on top of the so-called firefighting mode that we seem to be in well all i, I think that sums it up very well yeah, that sums it up very well. I think that it's not only short term, but long term. And he has pointed out cardiac, of course, lung is extremely concerning. We, uh, fibrotic lung you know, you know, hardly ever comes back, which may be the long term sequelae of the disease once we cross this major uh, uh, hurdle which we are dealing with right now. So I think we, we end this session. Thank you very much, Dr. Yadav. It's a pleasure to uh, meet you and hear your thoughts and extremely illuminating and adding to the, the knowledge spectrum which is there. We hope this is going to be useful to everybody. Um, have a lovely day. Insights from the world's best medical minds. You are watching the right doctors.com.